welcome. It's great to have you here for this guided meditation and Dharma talk. My name is Jonathan Faust. Thank you for making the time to be here. Um, as always, we start with a couple acknowledgments and thank yous. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge and thank our mindful movement teacher for this session. And also in advance to thank Ray Manioki and Tara Cassidy who offer mindful dialogue after this class. Um, if you want the whole Monday night experience, at 6.30 Eastern Standard Time, you can join a mindful movement class, which is a wonderful way to kind of access the present moment through the body. That uh, leads us up to 7.30 Eastern Standard for this meditation. The talk is at 8. And then after the talk, about 8.45, 8.50, you can join Mindful Dialogue, which is an opportunity to connect with a, a group of other folks, to talk about your practice, to talk about um, the talk, and it's beautifully facilitated by Ray and Tara. So if you want those links, you can go to my Facebook page or go to my webpage, jonathanfaust.com. None of this would happen without our producers. So a big thank you to Glenn Harrison and Leo Gimo for producing this evening. As well, a thank you to the Insight Meditation Community of Washington for hosting this class and and a big shout out to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Arlington in Arlington, Virginia, which has been the physical host of Monday Night Meditation pre-pandemic. If you'd like to sign up for a mailing list, um, not a, you don't have to sign up for the mailing list, you're signing up for the newsletter. <laughs> um, I offer a monthly newsletter, which gives a little summary of the talks of the month. I also share my uh, the best photos of the month with you little updates and so forth. And also, if you like, there's a weekly kind of giving you an advance notice of the uh, the next topic coming up. You can sign up there online. Also, just to let you know that uh, it's such a privilege to be able to share these practices and teachings, and it's all offered freely. It's really offered in the spirit of what's called dana or generosity. So there, this really says there should be no price for um, access to these teachings and practices because they are priceless. And to support that, um, if you feel moved to make a donation to help make this happen, it would be great. There are expenses that go into this, you know, now with online and video and video editing and all that good stuff. Um, I really appreciate that. And also, it's just great to have you here. It's great to share these practices with so many people around the planet. You know, since we've gone online, moving from in-person in Arlington, it's been quite interesting to see how um, how this class just has greater access. You know, people who can't make it to Monday night in Arlington, uh, but also people around the planet. It's um, it's really gratifying. So I'm, I'm really grateful. So we are going to talk, uh, we're going to explore a topic which I'm calling the how of now, um, which is how is it that we actually gain access to the here and now and what happens when you can live more and more in the now. So in order to do that, we're going to explore a number of, a number of practices as we move into our meditation. We'll explore, um, first of all, what it means to be in presence and be as opposed to do. Meditation has a very interesting element here because it's and not just a one-dimensional practice because some aspects of meditation are willful. You are doing, you are, you're calling your attention back to the here and now, you're gathering your attention and you're beginning to stabilize this pretty wacky mind to, to actually sit, like training a puppy. You know, has no idea what you're talking about in the beginning. Over time, with compassion, understanding puppies run off, the puppy begins to sit for longer and longer periods of time. So that is an integral part of, of a meditation practice. However, once the puppy begins to sit, something opens up. When your mind is actually here, you, you can begin to notice, wow, so this is what it's like to be. And then when your attention widens a little bit, you begin to notice, wow, things are changing. And you also notice, wow, there's something that's aware of change. And here you kind of toggle between bringing your attention back, stabilizing attention in the here and now, and then moving into that sense of being and observing. Really, really kind of a cool process. 
And then you can actually explore being on, on an even more subtle level, which is just letting go of doing and just really resting in that sense of absolutely letting things be just as they are without trying to control or manipulate at all. We can't get to that third stage without doing a little bit of due diligence, I find. And there are some times in my life when I just need to keep bringing myself back again and again and again because my mind is it's caught in hypervigilance or it's caught in worry or it's it's just really a bucking bronco other times it's very very easy to kind of rest in in a sense of ease and presence Since, as I've shared before one of the most one of the things I enjoy the most about being at, at the beach is just walking and looking at people when they're just looking out at the horizon you know, because you just see all these people who are, they're just in being mode. You know, they're just like open to the space. So as I lead this meditation, feel free to ignore anything I offer, because where you may be may not be where the instructions are. But I'll offer some general guidelines to kind of help us move and explore this sense of shifting from, from doing, from willful effort into being and resting in presence. So if you like, you can close both of your eyes. You might like to reach your arms overhead, let out any sounds, <clears throat> stretch in any way that feels good for you. And let yourself, as you close your eyes, and you can have your eyes open if you like. Many people find it's a little bit easier to get engaged and absorbed with the eyes closed. Take a moment just to kind of sense your posture what we're looking for is, here is balance. On the one hand, you might find yourself a little bit too vigilant in your posture. Maybe you're sitting up a little too straight or you're, you're holding some kind of tension. On the other hand, and I think many of us, after the end of a long day, we tend toward the other extreme. So we're kind of like leaning back or we're, we're, we're already in a little bit of a slump. Is there any way that you can adjust your posture so you have that sense of balance? And one way to do this is to take three long and slow deep breaths. Draw the breath up under the collarbones on the inhalation. Let yourself soften on the out breath. And as you lengthen the in breath, sense if you can lengthen through the spine, and particularly lengthen through the back of the neck and through the, through the base of the skull. And as you soften, again, just sense any little micro movements would help you to settle. And again, you might inhale. And if you like, you can inhale and hold the breath just for a moment. Just feel from the inside. And then let the breath gently flow as you exhale. And again, you might explore any little micro movements, maybe let your head drift a little bit to the left and to the right. You might want to open your jaw, move your jaw from side to side. Let's take a few moments here. Let your breath completely be relaxed. Take a few moments to sense what is it like right now, just to be. Nothing to do, nowhere to go. And as you do so, notice, in particular, notice the, the world of senses. Can you notice right now, can you identify all the sounds around you, 360 degrees? If your eyes are closed, can you just sense the, the play of light beyond your closed eyes? Noting the, the feeling tone externally, the, the sense of the air touching your skin, the, the texture of your clothing against your skin. What are the most predominant pressure points right now? Perhaps where you're seated, or your feet.
Noting now the internal feeling tone, are there any areas that you can identify right now that feel what you might call unpleasant? Any, any tightness, any holding, any congestion, stagnation? Is there anything now you can sense that's, that feels good, feels pleasant? Any areas that feel at ease or free flowing? Noting any areas that feel kind of in between, no particular strong, pleasant, or unpleasant sensations. And you might just take a few moments to, to explore what it's like to feel from the inside. One primary access to here and now is through opening to the feeling tone of the body, because the body only lives in the here and now. Sensing from the inside, the forehead smooth. Can you relax the muscles around and behind your eyes? And as you feel it from the inside, all the muscles of your face, is it possible to let your face move toward a sense of expressionlessness? Feeling the inside of your mouth. And sensing the, the jaw, perhaps noticing the, the masseter muscles, kind of the, the chomping muscles. And sensing through the length of the jaw, could you allow your jaw to relax or slacken a little bit? Can you now feel the weight and the volume of your arms? Down through the elbows and down through the wrists. And is it possible to feel from the inside now, the palms? Can you feel the volume of your thumbs? And the space inside each of your fingers. You might bring your attention now to your belly, just sensing the kind of the full belly. And is it possible here to let your belly soften? Maybe if you like, just to kind of aid this practice over the next three exhalations, how much more could you soften and relax and feel from the inside, the belly and the abdomen? Sensing now the, the buttocks, the floor, the pelvis, and the hip joints. And feeling the weight, the volume, the length of your legs down through the knees. And 
down through the ankles. Is it possible to feel the, the volume and the space inside your feet? And in particular, sensing the, the soles of the feet and the heels. Is it possible now to, to soften the whole body? Is it possible to feel from the inside this whole felt sense of the body? The more intimately you feel, the more intimately you are here and now. You might now guide your attention to an anchor of your choosing. For many of us, it's the breath at the nostrils or the belly or just a general sense of the breath. And you might just sense now over the next three breaths, how intimately can you feel the breath from the inside? You might like to explore the anchor of sound and you might, for the next few moments, just notice how intimately you can experience the sound vibrations, 360 degrees. And yet another option might be to to feel the palms of the hands as your anchor. And you might now, just for the next few moments, notice how intimately you can soften and feel any sense of pulse or tingling or vibration. And for this next period of time now, As best you can, let your attention rest here with your anchor, whatever you choose, breath or sound or the feeling in the palms, with the intention to feel from the inside, to intimately experience the aliveness. When the mind naturally wanders away, sense if you can note that with a smile and then gently invite your attention back. You may notice how each time you notice your mind has wandered, when you re-engage with your anchor, 
when you soften and feel from the inside, you can relax and begin to notice this deep sense of being. And you may notice how the more you relax and feel, the more you may notice this co-arising of an effortless kind of noticing. Noticing what's changing. Noting that there is a quality of doing in this practice. And noting if that doing can be really gentle. When you notice the mind is lost in a thought form, can you meet that with an inner smile? Like training a puppy. And gently guiding your awareness back to your anchor feeling from the inside and and then allowing yourself simply to rest in this sense of being being and allowing In this remaining five minutes or so, you might refresh your practice. Just noting again the sense of feeling from the inside, the forehead smooth. And the feeling inside of your face expressionless. Sensing the inside of the mouth. The space inside your throat. The belly. The soles of the feet. And you might, if you like, over the next three breaths, again, just sense how intimately can you experience from the inside your anchor. And you might like to move even more into this sense of 
resting in presence. If you like, if it feels right for you, let the sense of any sense of holding on to your anchor, let that fall away. And sense this spaciousness that can arrive when you deeply relax and feel and allow. Is there anything that could soften or relax or let go right now? Is there anything that could relax or soften or let go even more? You might explore over this next minute, how much more could you soften and relax and let be? You might now very gently introduce a little bit of doing. If you were to slow down and deepen your breath, notice what that feels like inside. And you might sense now what has shifted, what has changed over this last meditation. And as you're ready, letting your head drift a little to your left, a little to your right. <clears throat> Take all the time you need now just to adjust your posture to make your way back. You might find it helpful to reach your arms overhead. Deepen your breath, let out any sounds.
and welcome. So I'm just, just coming off uh, an experiment. Um, this week, Tara and I have elected to do a home retreat. We were going to be going somewhere warm um, for part of this month, and uh, that didn't happen due to COVID. So I thought, well, let's make it a home retreat. <clears throat> and, you know, oftentimes if you do a, a kind of a traditional Vipassana retreat, it's highly structured, you know, sit, walk, sit, walk, lunch, sit, walk, sit, walk, dinner. And what I elected to do for myself is there's a certain amount of hours, about four hours a day, where you're doing formal sitting. The rest of the time you're doing, you're doing walking, you're having meals, you're resting, that sort of thing. So I tried to work in that many hours as best I could. And the rest of the time was sort of balancing, it was just sort of being present. So I kind of invoked um, uh, Eric Kolvig, a retired Dharma teacher, a really wonderful guy. He offered, would often offer this instruction on a retreat uh, to now go wander like a happy dog. Let yourself just be in, in the moment. So, so there's formal sitting, but then also allowing yourself to uh, just to be present. So um, going for walks and things like that. It was a really, really cold week. So it was also tending to the fire, that sort of thing. But what I find really interesting about about being on a retreat, but also very powerful in life, is it's not just what you're doing, it's also what you're electing not to do. And one of the things that happens on a retreat is you formally step away from kind of external stimulation. The whole idea is remove the external stimulation, then the mind starts to become more present. And so, you know, Oftentimes, you, it's kind of a cliche, but when, you, when you're doing some inner work and you're realizing that you're holding on to something that's not really necessary, it's like getting your, it's like getting your life back, you know? And, and for me, in stepping away from the internet, uh, stepping away from that kind of like external social media stuff, it's like I started to get my attention back. I always thought I had kind of okay, I was okay in my, my hygiene uh, with the internet, but uh, wow, not engaging really demonstrated my, uh, there's a phrase, I grew up in Pennsylvania Dutch country, and there's a, a term called gritchy. <laughs> when you're gritchy, it's like you're, you're just irritated and you're, you're kind of wanting. And I, and I found myself kind of like wanting to like, oh, I want to go scroll. <laughs> so this is great for a great acronym that I love. It's called WAIT, W-A-I-T. Uh, why am I talking? Which is a really great question to ask yourself from time to time. I sort of adapted that to uh, what I think of as WAIS, W-A-I-S. Why am I scrolling? And I was aware how I'd be doing some research online and doing a little bit of YouTube, and then X number of minutes or hours later, like, why am I watching people betting on monkeys racing and go-karts right now? You know, it's just it's just a mirror of the mind, how the mind is this drunken monkey stung by scorpions, as Ramana Maharshi talked about. And so not engaging into social media really helped me as I kind of now making my way back and just seeing the instinct to to scroll, to look for the next thing, to sort of entertain my mind. And it's I'm a little horrified at how much um, technology has kind of seized upon my mind to kind of pull me from the here and now. Giving my giving my oh, my my own sense of empowerment of how I use my awareness, how it kind of pulls me away from here and now. So, I'd like to talk a little bit about how do you how do you remember the here and now. Uh, so I, I kind of entitled this talk the how of now, <laughs> because we're all so pulled away from the here and now. We're so distracted. And now we're, we're sort of balance, battling, if you will, this technology that is designed to keep grabbing your attention and that is more and more clever in pulling you away. 
So I'd like to talk about four things. The first is how, how the ego is dedicated to survival of itself. That becomes a very, very big factor when it comes to accessing the here and now. I'd like to talk about how there's a role of pain in waking up and in how embodied awareness is a powerful tool for cultivating presence in here and now. And then some thoughts of what it's like to actually live more in the present moment and then how to do that. So as I launch into this, from time to time, you might sort of ask yourself, how do I come back to the here and now when you notice yourself you know, caught in the mind or with the mind drifting? You know, I kind of see how in my life I go through these periods, and it's really kind of like three things. It's like ambition. I see a possibility and inspiration. I get excited about it. And then execution, actually making it happen. I think there are, you know, there are four basic types when it comes to the kind of like, it's, it's a wonderful business model to really see. There are people who are entrepreneurs. You know, they get the vision. That's their gift. And then there are the administrators, those, are those who are really good at organizing and managing. And then there are the integrators. These are the people who really love to kind of oil the machinery so everyone's working together. And then there are the producers, the, the folks who just, they just love to get things done. And there's sort of this mythology that we're supposed to be perfectly balanced among all, all four. But the truth is, it's really helpful to find out what you do best and then find others who can balance you out. And I tend to be more in the entrepreneurial realm, I'm a little bit more of the dreamer. And I was reminded of how when I was a kid, you know, maybe nine or 10 or 11, somewhere in there, I wanted to build a tree house. You know, I grew up on a farm, we had a lot of trees. And I, I'm a dreamer, so I fantasized about it. I thought about how much fun it would be. Um, you know, there's lots of scrap wood and I just said, I'm, I want to build a tree house. And, and e either my dad was preoccupied, um, or he was just interested in what I would do in terms of actually building it, moving from dreaming to doing. And I remember having this vision in my head of this really beautiful tree house and then being overwhelmed. How do I, how do I, how do I get this done? And I was really stymied, like I had no idea where to start. I had an older brother, four years older than me, he was kind of very mechanically gifted. And, and so he kind of showed me, you know, well, you, got, you got to find the, you know, the, the four by fours for your foundation. And then, then you've got to find a way to cut that in advance and get that up in the tree and then and lay out the studs and then make sure you have enough wood for the flooring and, and so forth. And I found that really, it was, it was a really powerful kind of awakening for me as a kid of moving from dreaming to, oh, so to execute things, I really have to chunk it out. If I have a big project, it can seem so overwhelming and paralyzing. But if I can break it down into the little bite-sized pieces, then I actually have kind of access to something I can do right now. And I have this thing in meditation, and maybe you've noticed this too, where you're thinking, okay, I'm going to sit for 30 minutes. And I certainly had this on my retreat. Okay, I'm going to do 45 minutes. So I sit down and I'm thinking, okay, it's been at this for a while. And I look at my watch, it's been, wait a minute, it's only been three minutes. <laughs> have you ever had that experience? So oftentimes what I'll do when I'm meditating is I just will focus on three breaths. So if I'm going to meditate for 45 minutes, when my, I realize my mind has wandered, and it seems like the mind is taking over, like the mind is now dominating, and I'm completely disconnected from any embodied sense of here and now, three breaths. So let's just try it, if you like. You can close your eyes. And if you would, just take three slow, full, and deep breaths. And 
You just notice, feel the imprint, feel the effect. How three slow, deep breaths has a tendency to call your awareness from the outer world to the inner world. And now, if you would, take again three slow, deep breaths. And if you can, try and smooth out the breath. Let the breath be really, really smooth. Three slow, deep, and smooth breaths. If you'd like, you can gently deepen the breath. You know, I, I find it interesting how, how much my mind, and I think all our minds, tend to be future-oriented. You know, I spend a lot of time hallucinating horrible, all the horrible things that can happen. And I think a lot of our anxiety comes from a mind that is so future-oriented. And particularly nowadays, how much have you been caught in, in anxiety about what's going on in our culture right now? Uh, the, the threats on democracy, the, the impact of climate change, uh, like the talk of civil war in our culture. It's so easy to get pulled into that sense of fear and anxiety and, and three breaths becomes this very interesting way of calling yourself back. The more intimately you can feel on the inside, the more, if just for a few moments, you, you actually have access to the here and now. That's the good news. And the bad news is that if we don't learn how to pause, then I think we're just kind of doomed to be nothing more than reaction machines. We're constantly moving toward the, the desire for pleasure or moving away from the hallucination of pain. And our whole life really is structured around our relationship to pain, primarily how to avoid it and how, if you're experiencing it, how to nuke it and make it go away. So the sense of, of seeing how pain plays into your relationship to now can be really liberating. You know, the, the football playoffs are happening right now, and I have a kind of a losing interest in football, particularly if Tom Brady retires. I, I think I'm, I may be done with it. But I, was, I, was, I just caught this interview with a professional football player, and they said, well, what is your main motivation in, in playing football? I loved his honesty. He said, the fear of letting my teammates down. Wow. It, it was not the joy of absorbing myself in a game I loved to play as a boy. It was the fear of letting my teammates down. Fear. The primary, the four primary elements of fear show up as the fear of failure, the fear, the fear of being insignificant, the fear of pain, and the fear of shame. And it's interesting when you think about those elements in your life. You might just take a moment, if you like, just a short little Zen pop quiz reflection. If you'd like, you can close your eyes. Just take a moment and just sense how do these elements play in your life? How much does the fear of failure show up? How much does the, the fear of being insignificant show up in your life? The fear of pain, the fear of shame or blame. How much is that a driving force in your life? If you'd like, you can open your eyes if you close them. This becomes such a powerful inquiry. And have you ever have you ever thought to yourself, if I wasn't driving myself, if I wasn't pushing myself, I'd be lazy. 
If I accepted myself fully, then I would lose all motivation. I know it's an operative belief for many of us. It certainly is for me. But I think it's important to challenge that. Who would you be if you were not captured by the fear of failure, the fear of insignificance, of pain, of blame? Chances are you might feel free. <laughs> you might feel creativity. You might feel a sense of that sort of like fearless curiosity, like a child that shows up. When we're caught in fear, we're caught in resistance. Resistance to the way things are. And that's a great definition of pain, that pain is a resistance to the way that things are. And so we motivate ourselves through pain and we're manipulated through pain. If you don't buy this toothpaste, no one will kiss you again. And if they do kiss you, they will be indescribably grossed out. Unless you vote for me, this country is doomed. We are driven and manipulated by pain. And to the, to the degree that you resist life, you are inevitably going to experience pain, stress, unsatisfactoriness, unsteadiness of mind. And what's interesting, and there's some beautiful teachings, and when it comes to, the, to now, Eckhart Tolle is a wonderful teacher. We're so identified with our resistance to life that the idea of letting go of that resistance can be terrifying. So Eckhart has this beautiful teaching about the pain body. And the pain body is that, that part of yourself that needs you to feel pain so it can survive. You could call it the, the ego, the egoic structure, that part of you that feels separate from, from the wholeness of life. The pain body, if you will, is composed of your painful experiences and it, and it grows, it feeds on when you feel pain. So this, this element of, of ego or pain or the pain body it tries to make you feel miserable and sad. Anytime you feel annoyance or frustration or anger, then in Eckhart's model, then the pain body has taken control. It, it clouds your ability to see clearly. And it's truly frightening to me to see how much the media and social media and political parties have learned how to push the pain button. And when you look at the headlines, just a couple of headlines I saw as I got off my retreat. Is it too late to save democracy? How the airlines are ripping you off. I love this one. This silent killer that's in the breakfast you ate this morning. Holy moly. Number one, really hard not to click on those. And number two, just the mastery of hooking the mind, pulling you into pain, pulling you into separateness, getting your attention and pulling you away from the here and now. And the interesting thing here is that even though pain seems to come from the external world, much of our pain is self-created. As we say in the mindfulness world, it's not so much what is happening, but how you're relating to it. So when we talk about the ego or the egoic conditioning, it's the you that's trying to control your life. It's the, the you that, is, that feels itself as a separate being and it's trying to assert itself in this world. And so when we're caught in this, we, we spend all of our time either trying to dominate or trying to avoid domination. And when you look around, you see it everywhere. The perception of enemies, of the good and bad people, the, the never-ending, escalating realm of anxiety. It's all about the self trying to figure everything out and, and gain control. 
And so this realm of fear, this realm of pain, this realm of the pain body, uh, it's kind of a hell realm because it just keeps feeding on itself. So that's the bad news. <laughs> the good news is that there's a way to work with it. There is a way out. So what is that way out? Well, just a little story. Uh, before the retreat, my my wonderful wife was uh, a little bit wrapped up in the pain body. <laughs> And right before going to bed, usually we kind of have this ritual where we share magic moments, which is kind of a fun thing, you know, a magic moment from the day or what you're grateful for. But for some reason, she <laughs> she was caught up on just her anxiety around like, you know, like the most important thing for her is, is preserving democracy because if the vote is suppressed, then horrible things will happen, you know, so she was just talking about, you know, the importance of it and what can she do and her fears of civil war and the suppression, you know, of the minority, what might occur, you know, climate change and all of her denial around climate change. And if there's a big change in administrations, how like all the climate work will be not be done and we're just going to, it's just going to come on faster and on and on and on. And then we went to bed, and then I woke up at 2 a.m. completely panicked. Like, uh, that, that, that whole conversation just went right into my subconscious, and boy, oh boy, I was just, my pain body was activated. <clears throat> now, it's not uncommon for me to wake up. Um, I wake up a number of times during the night. I, uh, if you've listened to my talks, you know I'm a little bit manic around sleep and sleep hygiene. So my main strategy for kind of getting back to sleep, and I, it varies, but right now it's to lengthen the exhalation. So the exhalation is longer than the inhalation. And just name one body part at a time and feel from the inside. And so as a long exhalation, I would just say left arm. Next exhalation, right arm. And lo and behold, over, it didn't take that long, I actually fell asleep again. So what happened was I shifted my attention from the thinking mind, the planning mind, the egoic mind, to absorb it as deeply as I could into a sense of embodied here and now. <clears throat> so just to try this for a moment. Again, if you like Zen Pop Quiz, you can close your eyes. And if you would, take in, you can inhale to about maybe three or four, count to three or four in the inhalation, then exhale maybe five or six. And just see, 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 since if you can set up that pattern, you're inhaling to maybe three, a count of three or four, and exhaling to the count of five or six. And on, now on the exhalation, you might just feel from the inside uh, the left palm. On the next exhalation, feel the right palm. On the next exhalation, feel the belly. On the next exhalation, feel the back of the head. And just notice has anything shifted just in these moments, these few breaths? If you'd like, you can let your eyes open. They've been closed. The power of the ego is in the mind. The mind produces pain and the pain body 
by continually bringing up memories of the past or a future that's ridden with anxiety. And since you can't alter the past and worrying about what's next only cultivates more suffering, the doorway is right here. The doorway is the body, a sense of embodied presence. The body only lives in the present tense. The body, the body doesn't lie. So the answer, if you will, or the solution is so simple. It's so simple, it's ridiculous. And it's the easiest thing to overlook. And this, of course, is the, it's the foundation of mindfulness meditation. Present moment embodied awareness. <clears throat> one of my favorite teachers, Gil Fransdahl, went to Southeast Asia, one of the first Westerners to go and study meditation. And he found a little meditation community and they pointed out his kuti, his little hut. He said, well, go over there and let's check in in a week. And he said, well, wait a minute, what are the, what are the instructions? And they said, oh, keep your attention in your body. That's it. That's it. So remembering this, so important. One of my practices in my home retreat this week, I made my anchor the soles of my feet. Just feeling the soles of the feet. If you just take a moment, can you feel the soles of your feet right now? And if you really soften and feel, you might be able to feel a little pulse or tingling or vibration. And for me, it was just a, a wonderful little grounding practice. How you pay attention to this felt sense of the body is through many, many doorways. You know, so many traditions. Do you, do you focus on the breath at the nostrils? Do you focus on the belly? Do you, do you do a body scan? Do you focus on the vibration of sound? Do you feel the body as you move? It's Take your pick. Some traditions really ascribe this is where you focus. Other traditions offer options. I find it's really helpful to, to give yourself permission to have options as to how you, how you explore. But it can also be helpful to, to narrow your attention a little bit too, just so you can drill a little bit deeper. If, if, if you're not focused, it, it's, it can sort of become, you become like a little bit of a shopper. Like as soon as you hit difficulty, like, oh, breath isn't working, let me move to sound. So finding that balance between having choice, but also stick with one that's going to give you um, a sense of deepening connection. So the body is not only a very powerful way to access the here and now and calm a restless mind, but it is a very powerful sanctuary. And, and as this tradition says, it's not only a way to be the foundation of practice and calm the mind, but it's also pointed out, it's a, the doorway to real freedom and liberation. From a sense of here and now and embodied presence, you can begin to explore how to be present, how to be present with your mind, and, and how to be present in the world. Eckhart Tolle, this beautiful quote, he said, people don't realize that now is all there ever is. There's no past or future except as a memory or anticipation in your mind. And it is not uncommon for people to spend their whole life waiting to start living. So how do we move from ego and fear and the pain body and self-preservation to present moment awareness? How do we move to a sense of freedom and liberation? Swami Kripalu, who was a main teacher for me for much of my life, after a life dedicated to practice, when he kind of left our ashram to move back to India, he was asked, what's the highest quality of a spiritual seeker? I thought for sure his answer would be, whatever you're enjoying, stop it. 
you know, focus, knuckle down. But instead, he said, the highest quality of a spiritual seeker is self-observation without judgment. So it has to do with your relationship, not just to your body, but your relationship to your mind. Your relationship to, your relationship to awareness itself. So a little experiment again, if you like. If you like, you can close your eyes. And if you would, you might take, again, three slow, smooth, and deep breaths. Feel the breath on the inside. And just sense what it's like to, to feel the aliveness of sensation And notice that there's this quality of, of the observer. You can be aware of sensation. What is it that is aware of feeling right now? And you might notice that this awareness is also aware of your thoughts. So let yourself explore the following question. What will my next thought be? When you ask that question, what will my next thought be? It has a way of pointing back to, to be, being aware of awareness itself. And just take a moment. Is it possible if just for a, a moment to be aware of awareness? So if you like, you might deepen your breath and you might, again, open your eyes if you like. The body becomes a doorway. Awareness itself becomes a doorway. So how do we be aware of self and be in the world? So I mentioned how the pain body or the egoic structure is, is run by fear, run by pain. It's the fear of pain. It's the fear of insignificance, the fear of loss, the fear of shame, and the fear of blame. And that also sets us up for greed, for wanting. So the mind naturally wants the opposite. So we have this greed or desire for pleasure. We have this natural inborn greed or desire for, for fame, for winning, for praise. But it's so interesting is in the moment, in the now, these eight worldly winds, there's no wind. So it becomes a question of resourcing. Trauma. Fear and helplessness automatically sets us up for self-preservation. So we automatically move into aggression. We move into withdrawal or we freeze. So an important, important way of working with trauma, and there's big trauma, little trauma, is resourcing. And the body becomes a very powerful form of resourcing. And so... When you use the body as a tool for bringing yourself back, when you notice your mind caught in those eight worldly winds, you might just sense, if I take three breaths right now, where do I feel the breath? Eckhart Tolle was once asked, I, I hear what you're saying about the power of now, but how do you do it? I don't, I don't get it. 
And he asked this fellow, he said, can you feel your hand right now? And I said, well, yeah. He said, congratulations. So remembering to bring yourself back to the, to the tangible, physical sense of here and now becomes a very powerful tool for resourcing. And you can apply this in so many ways when you're just to feel the breath, when you're, as I would like to say, when you're washing the dishes to, to feel washing the dishes meditation, when you're taking a shower, how embodied can you be as you're taking, taking a shower? Call yourself back. And so when we're living in the world and you are really focusing on being more and more in the here and now, how it shows up in relationships is so powerful. And I have just a few minutes left, but I'd mentioned earlier how this, this acronym that can be really helpful of WAIT, W-A-I-T. You know, why am I talking? Have you ever noticed when you're talking with someone that really what you're doing is waiting for them to stop talking so you can talk? So powerful to bring in the sense of now into the relational field when you can really pause when you can really listen to the other what the other person is saying when you can really reflect back on what the other person has just said it changes the equation so powerfully when you become more present moment focused it can change your relationships. On the other hand, it can be challenging. It can be the person like, wow, hey, you're a lot more fun. <laughs> or it can be like, hey, wait a minute, you're, you're calling me into the here and now. I'm not sure I want to be in the here and now right now. So it becomes a very powerful thing. And I notice this a lot in relationships that when, when one person becomes a much more present moment, mindfully aware, Either the other person is like, wow, what are you doing? This is really lighting me up. Or it's like, wait a minute, you're, you're challenging me here. And I'm, I'm actually finding it better to kind of engage you into the pain body you know, and into sort of our, our shared pain. So there's so much more to say here. But when you come into the here and now, it's not about avoiding pain but it's about exploring how to be with it. Living in the here and now is not a passive practice, not at all. When you can disengage from fear, disengage from the pain body, when you can actually resource yourself in the here and now, you can be so much more dynamic when you engage. One of my teachers, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, kind of the founder of TM, has this great phrase. He said, the more dynamic your rest, the more dynamic your activity. <clears throat> so simple, but wow, there's so much in there. When you can step back from fear and greed and pain, and resource yourself in the here and now, you will absolutely be more dynamic when you engage. You will be informed by that sense of presence. So a meditation practice is so powerful and it's so powerful to build in the mindful moments, just one breath. As I've shared before, I, I once set my beeper watch to go off every hour, one breath every hour. Mostly it was obnoxious. But every now and then, it really, really helped. And now the plus is whenever anyone else's alarm watch goes off, I automatically take one breath. So that, that Pavlovian response really works for me. But here's a really powerful, another powerful quote from Eckhart Tolle. Whatever the present moment contains, accept it as if you had chosen it. And I, I love that. because it allows you to shift your relationship to what's happening. 
It's moving from the self-preservation reaction to life to an active, the possibility of active investigation. So if you like, you might close your eyes. We're going to close out here with a very short meditation. And in your own way, you might take three slow breaths. And let this feeling tone of the breath inside be this invitation, once again, just to come into the here and now. And sense, if you can, how this felt sense of embodied awareness is your doorway. How in this moment, when you are relaxed and intimately present, that you can sense the possibility of being free from fear and free from greed. And sensing how this refuge of the body is present in one breath. And sensing as well how when you explore what it means to observe the moment without judgment, that something can open up inside. As you're ready, you can deepen the breath. As you're ready, you can open the eyes. Thank you so much for your, your time and attention. I, I, I hope you found this helpful. I find that in these days of so much global stress, so much anxiety, it's incumbent on each of us to find a way to slow down and be present. As a great meditation master, Thich Nhat Hanh, said that when, when the, the boat is in wild seas, everyone looks for the calm one in the boat. And if there's one person calm in that boat, everyone else will be calm. And may these practices help you be the calm one in your boat to be not only a resource for yourself, but to be more and more available to others in these times of such challenge. Thank you again. Many, many blessings. Great to have this time with you.